Turn the lights back on. Wow. Retro Electro Tech. When real audio ruled the world. world. Greetings once again, all you knuckle-dragging, wild and wooly bipeds of vintage audio persuasion. This is Retro Ernest of Retro Electrotech, and today on the bench is yet another receiver. This time a Pioneer SX1280, and this was manufactured in 1977, and it comes strutting into the ring like the late Muhammad Ali, swinging wildly at 185 watts per channel into 8 ohms. And this big old gut-busting bruiser weighs in at 63 pounds, so I better be careful when I'm lugging this thing around the shop. Anyways, this uh, came to me with a noisy uh, intermittent signal complaint that is associated with the controls the owner believes. But you never know until we start getting into the evaluation what we're going to find if our intermittent signal is on account of a failing component or some other type of connection issue. And that said, I will go through the usual process of safe power up and I will check such things as, you know, DC balance, especially when I'm getting to that point where I'm going to hook it up to the shop test speakers. But uh, anyways, and uh, you know, I'll get into checking and setting the idle current as needed, things like that, the usual stuff. And uh, the rest is just a matter of um, discovering along the way if there's anything else going on. So let's go ahead and get into the process. Okay, so I'm getting ready to do the dim bulb thing. But before I do that, I want to just mention that if I take in a piece of equipment that is in regular use and nothing bad has happened to it, you know, the customer brings it in and, you know, doesn't tell me that, hey, you know, um, this thing let out smoke, it made a big scary noise or something like that. In this case where it's just staticky, intermittent controls, but otherwise it's functioning and it's in normal uh, everyday use, then I don't always, uh, you know, pop the hood, you know, pop the top off before powering uh, the unit up. If it's a piece of equipment that's unknown or the customer brings it in and says, hey, this thing made a scary noise, uh, I smelled something bad, you know, smoke or something was burning, well, obviously, before I power it up, I'm going to always make sure I'm going to, you know, pop the hood first, perform a visual inspection, look around to see what there is to see, and um, all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> so, because there's a lot of things I do too off, um, off camera. For example, like I mentioned a moment ago, you know, at some point I'm going to check the, uh, the DC balance, I'm going to check idle current, and so forth and so on and you know I don't always do that on camera but that doesn't mean that I don't do it so anyways let's go ahead and uh, get to it I'm going to um, click in a bulb if I don't knock the camera over over first so let me go ahead and do that all right all right and that bulb is dimming down nicely and I heard our relay. Okay, so I'm, as usual, I'm gonna let it um, sit on the current limiter for just a little bit and make sure um, the receiver doesn't start behaving funny. And after that, I will be right back and we'll go ahead and see what there is to see with a little bit of uh, function testing and so forth. Okay, so our DUT here, device under test, has been on the current limiter for Oh, about 15, 20 minutes, not a single hiccup, nor did I expect there would be any problems. So let's get on with uh, some testing. And before we do so, I want to mention that we have a special guest that's back with us today. We have Retro Bar. Hello, all my people. Be 
peace and love to the people. Okay, so thank you for the help, Retrobot. Appreciate it. No problem. So what you see here on the meter, guys, is our DC balance. And this represents what's on both channels. It's pretty much the same. And we are high, as you can see. Um, it's bouncing around, you know, the upper 200s, 300 and something millivolts. So I'm going to get into the uh, unit in just a bit and see if I could tame that down just a little bit and get as close to zero as we possibly can. So let's go ahead and get to it. And then after I do that, then I'll go into some function testing as far as checking the uh, controls and see how noisy they are and, and intermittent and all that. Okay, as you can see, I have the hood popped on this SX1280. And I was going in here to tweak the DC balance a bit, see if I could tame that down. But my priority has changed at the moment. I'm still going to tweak around with the DC balance, but you can see I'm zoomed in on this uh, power supply board here, the protection board. And you may notice that the um, there's some shrinkage happening um, on the insulative uh, sleeves of these uh, capacitors. You can see the little one over here and then these three here, which is a good indicator of these caps heating up. And sure enough, if I just kind of kind of touch them, that cap's really, really hot. The one next to it here, um, this one, yeah, that's that's blazing hot. I can't even touch that. Yeah, they're all really, really hot. Let me let me check the uh, temperature on these. Yeah, you can see my you can see my maximum temperature here. It was kind of jumping around, but the max is 171, you know, 163 degrees. These are 85 uh, 85C caps, so you know, 85 degrees uh, Celsius, which is equal to what 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So these these caps are just really uh, pushing up against that limit. They're getting super, super hot. So I'm sure that um, obviously they're internally degraded, high ESR. These, uh, these uh, boards here are going to need to be recapped. Now, um, let me go ahead and just back out a second. Okay, so we're all backed out. So you can take a look at the landscape here. I checked the temperature of all the other caps top side and everything's looking good. Um, the caps that are getting blazing hot here are on this power supp supply board and the uh, protection board. So I'll get into that when I'm you know, ready to hit that stage. But anyways, uh, moving forward, the receiver here is back on the current limiter. Because, like I said, now that I discovered that these caps are getting blazing hot and they're um, getting ready to poop the bed, which they could do at any time, they might fail silently, they might fail catastrophically, vent open, and, and uh, you know end up causing damage. So we need to keep this on the current limiter. It just goes to show you with all of this old gear that's multiple decades old, you really got to be careful when you're powering it up and running it and all that. The, again, this was in daily use with the customer. So I wasn't horribly worried about uh, anything going bad, but you know you just never know what you're going to run across. So you always got to weigh on the side of caution. And I did initially when I powered it up on the current limiter safely, but um, now I know I don't want to keep it off the current limiter. So anyways, I'm going to get with the customer and let them know what I found there. And uh, I'll have to order some caps uh, there's some caps on these boards that I do not have in stock. So I'm going to do that. And um, in the meanwhile, though, I will move forward with um, at least putting a signal in here. I'm going to keep it um, under heavy current limiting. But I am going to put a signal into it and just mess around with the controls, take a look at uh, the scope, and see if any of these controls are getting noisy uh, and or um, exhibiting uh, intermittent um, behavior, you know, if the signal's dropping in and out and all that. So we're going to check for that because I know I'm going to end up doing um, full service on the controls, switches and pots, but I want to see which ones are uh, the worst out of all the controls and go from there. 
So I'm going to do that, but um, I'm going to hold off on working on the uh, on the boards here until I get all the caps in. Also, too, one thing I want to mention is that I'm not just going to recap for the sake of recapping because the you know caps are getting hot. I need to go through and check other components, component values, and see if anything has drifted or whatever the case, if there's an underlying cause as to why these caps are heating up other than just age and degradation. Uh, that could very well be the case on its own, but there may be an underlying reason why these caps are heating up. So I need to go through the board and check everything out to make sure there's not an underlying cause. When I do that, I will do a part two video on that. But like I said, I need to get the caps that I don't have in stock. But in the meantime, though, we'll get into uh, looking at the controls and going from there. Okay, so as I get close to concluding this part one video, um, I want to mention that I've had the unit powered up, like I said. It's current limited because I don't want anything catastrophic to take place with those caps. And um, I've been going through checking the uh, you know various switches and potentiometers as I always do, especially in a situation where we're having um, problems with intermittent or noisy signal. A lot of times, and not all the time, but a lot of times it has to do with crappy controls, okay? Over time, you know, these controls get a bit fickle and will um, manifest that with, you know, problems as far as noise, noisy controls, you know, intermittent behavior, the audio signal cutting in and out. Okay, we know this, a lot of us do. So, um, you can see if I zoom in over to the oscilloscope screen over there, you can see that I have symmetrical signal on both channels right now, okay? I'm reaching over and messing with the volume control. But it wasn't like that early on, and I wish I would have got a lot of this on video, but I was kind of messing around with a lot of controls, trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more before I end this video and zoom in on some other uh, caps that I found that are not looking so good and all that because I want to drive this home to the uh, customer as to what's going on and what needs to be resolved first before we get into um, further diagnostics and monitoring of the uh, you know device under test here, this receiver. So, um, you can see everything's looking good right now, and it has been for quite some time, several hours now. But in the beginning, the signal was jumping all over the place. I was losing the right channel. Um, when I was messing with some of the uh, controls, you know, it seemed like there was some influence some of the time, and then other times, not so much. So it was really hard to hone in on what was going on. I think what I was experiencing was a combination of things going on that um, are not exhibiting you know, themselves anymore, at least not at this point. So I think I was having some issues with uh, finicky caps that kind of mallowed out as, I, as I've had this unit running for a while now. And I think that some of the controls could have been uh, a bit problematic. I know there's this muting switch up here that attenuates the um, volume by um, minus 20 dB. Let me just flip this around a little bit. So this muting switch up here seemed to be finicky and causing asymmetry. Um, with the, with the uh, signal on the scope, you know, uh, asymmetry between both channels. In other words, it was attenuating uh, one channel but not the other, and then one channel's amplitude would, you know, kind of jump up and kind of get jittery. So um, when I suspect a control is maybe, you know, problematic in terms of connection, you know, I'll kind of check it a little bit, um, a little bit in depth, meaning that I will also 
check where the um, switch is soldered to the board, if it's soldered to a board. And I took my um, non-conductive, um, you know, little pointer and started flexing the board a little bit in this area. And, you know, lo and behold, it did seem to have some influence on the, uh, on the right channel, the waveform on the right channel. You know, when I would kind of flex the board, the uh, amplitude was um, moving along with it. Things like that, okay? I just bring that up because I was experiencing some odd behavior in this receiver that I attribute to uh, several things going on at one time. So, the moral of the story is this. Before I can really hone in on uh, any other problems, and pardon the noise in the background, the heater's kicking on. So before I can hone in on any other issues, what I want to do is remove likely culprits from the equation. These controls are not real bad in the sense that, you know, when I manipulate the switches or rotate the pots, I'm getting all kinds of static and crackle on the waveform. Nothing like that. They're not that bad. But I do think that maybe internally some of the contacts are a little tarnished and um, I was experiencing that in the very beginning because sometimes when you have controls that although are not horribly dirty internally controls that are not exercised very often in other words the owner of the unit doesn't use certain controls a lot and they always sit in the same position sometimes over over the years the contacts internally will start to get a little bit uh, tarnished and that can vary a bit depending on you know how the uh, piece of equipment is is stored over its life in what kind of uh, environment climate uh, if they're expo exposed to higher humidity levels etc etc so the moral of the story is I need to go through and service the switches that is a good idea to have these controls maintenanced every every so often and uh, they will let you know when they need servicing you'll start having problems with noise and intermittent behavior and all that or sometimes too and I forgot to mention because you know there's always so many things to cover is that a control especially one that is used frequently could just wear okay it just becomes worn out the contacts internally and so forth and sometimes you know, as a result, it will need to be replaced. So the point is, there's factors to consider sometimes. It, you know, sometimes it's not always dust and little pieces of debris. Sometimes it's environmental factors, you know, high humidity, how a unit was stored, how it lived out its life, so forth, that could in affect the um, internal contacts of a control, a switch, whatever, and just wear and tear. So that's the point that I kind of wanted to nail down and I did it in kind of a roundabout way, so sorry about the big digression. I'm a narrative person, in case you haven't noticed. So anyways, um, that's that. So I'm gonna take care of the controls and those caps. Those electrolytics need to be replaced um, on the, you know, again, going back to this, um, this power supply board you know, these caps here that are getting really, really, really hot. And I also want to uh, zoom in on something else too. Okay, so we're looking at an electrolytic here on one of the amp boards that is um, leaking onto the board. And I don't know if I can, let me see if I can drop this down just a little bit so that we can see under the cap a little bit better. Yeah, let me bear with me here just a moment. So, anyways, um, it, and it does appear that it's coming from under the under the cap there, and you know it's kind of extending around here as well. So we need to get these get these caps out of here. Um, there's another cap on the other channel that's doing the same thing. Let me just zoom back out, get this out of the way. Okay, so um, the point is, before I go into, I guess, deeper diagnostics, it's important to 
do the common sense thing, take the common sense approach to troubleshooting and get things out of the way that are going to hinder your diagnostic efforts, at least as far as going into more uh, detailed diagnostics, okay? Because just like a triage situation, when somebody, you know, goes into an emergency room or medics arrive on scene and there's a subject uh, with multiple injuries, you got to hone in on the stuff that's causing immediate problems, immediate threats to life. And then after you take care of, you know, profuse hemorrhaging, airway problems and all that stuff, then you can uh, deal with the secondary complaints and things that are not life threatening. So kind of a kind of a funny analogy maybe maybe not but the point is, is that there's things in this receiver that need to be dealt with first there's obvious problems you know electrolytics that are getting blazing hot and we got electrolytics that are leaking physically leaking so we need to get that taken care of get controls cleaned up and uh, just kind of go through and touch up solder joints remember i told you that i was flexing that board and uh, you know, I was getting a uh, response with the signal on one channel kind of reacting to that, showing that there may be some connection issues on the back of that board there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are things I want to get with the owner about so that I can get the green light and go from there. But I wanted to kind of show them what's going on, and you guys that are interested in following along, you can kind of see what's going on. So once I uh, you know, get the caps in place, get things cleaned up, get the controls all worked on, then I will be back. And then if we need to get into deeper diagnostics and really start tracing, tracing out the signal and finding out where something is either dropping off or where there's noise being produced, then we'll get into that. But hopefully, um, you know, the caps and controls and all that will resolve the problem that uh, we were, that I was experiencing earlier and that the um, owner was experiencing. And um, we'll go from there. So as I always say, guys, peace, love, music, and the vintage audio that brings it to your ears. Till next time. This is a poor man's shoe production. <laughs>